Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this uh, to the John Sutton Lecture. It's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Paul Thompson. Paul's a chief of cardiology at Hartford Hospital in Connecticut, former president of ACSM. And his paper in JAMA in 1982 about jogger death uh, during running from joggers in Rhode Island probably started the whole field of sports cardiology. And whenever I don't know what to do with a difficult patient, I call Paul. He's my go-to guy and a brilliant clinician, a wonderful speaker, and we're real pleased to have him give the Sutton Lecture on are there deleterious cardiac effects from prolonged exercise. Paul? These are my conflicts of interest, which are not listed in the brochure because it's too hard to fill out the online form. I also have a conflict of interest in that I'm a real John Sutton admirer, so it's a real honor for me to give this presentation. So I want to give you a little bit about John. Don't know why that happens. Okay. It's a little small here, so boom, boom. So a little bit about John, and that is that he died in uh, 1996 at the a young age of 54 years. This is a picture of John on one of his treks. He was a real adventurer. Um, he graduated from the University of Sydney in 1965 with a degree in medicine. He hitchhiked across Nepal, India, and China during that, after his graduation. And it was China during the Cultural Revolution, and that was typically John. He left Australia for McMaster University in Canada in 1972. He was going for a year, and he stayed 17 years, and he left after becoming the dean of the faculty. If you knew him, you knew he was just this Australian who embraced you and was a lot of fun. And um, you can understand why he became the dean of the faculty. Hey, my gosh, it's going to be a problem. There's only one button here, and I have a big thumb. The other thing that's really um, <clears throat> I've always admired about him is he participated in the Mount Logan uh, climbing expeditions from 1973 to 1980, and he did his own quadriceps biopsies, where he anesthetized himself into the biopsies. He also organized Operation Everest, which was the um, attempt to simulate climbing Mount Everest in a, uh, bariatric, in a bariatric chamber, barometer chamber, and then he was president of the American College of Sports Medicine in 1986. So some of this talk is from this uh, paper by Thijs Eisvogels and others. Uh, from the, Thijs is from the Netherlands in Jack about exercise at the extremes. And in that paper is this graph showing that you get the most benefit of exercise when you go from almost nothing to something. And that it kind of flattens out as you get out here. What we're going to talk about is what goes on way out at the end of that curve if something does go on. There is this suggestion that there may be an increase in risk at the highest levels of physical activity, but clearly not proven. Um, we've also summarized this, or at least Thijs, myself, and Antonio Fernandez have summarized this in a journal that was pub in a Physiologic Review article that was published recently. So before we start, let's get one thing straight, okay? And that is I came here not to bury exercise, but to praise it. And I didn't make that up, that's not original. Um, but I do think there are some interesting clinical observations that are worthy of discussion and investigation. And so what I want you to do is I want to open your mind to the possibility that exercise, like any medicine, at the extreme, has potentially deleterious effects. Here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about cardiac events with exercise. And particularly, we're going to talk about cracking coronary plaques and healing them. We're going to talk about cardiac biomarkers and exercise, and I put cardiac in parentheses in because parentheses, I want to give you a point of view. We're going to talk about ventricular dysfunction, but we're primarily going to talk about the right ventricle. We're going to talk about cardiac fibrosis and lifelong endurance athletes and how we measure that and what it might mean. We're going to answer the question, is there, oh, no, we're not going to answer the question. We're going to address the question as to whether there's accelerated atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in athletes. We want to talk about atrial fibrillation in athletes, and I'll bet if there are a lot of lifelong endurance athletes in here, there's a lot of atrial fibrillation. And we're going to talk about whether there is a genetic vulnerability to exercise negative effects, and I'm going to try to convince you that there are. So this is our study that Ben mentioned, published way back in 1982. 
And what we did is Bill Sterner, who was the chief medical examiner, collected all the sudden deaths during exercise in Rhode Island, there's only one medical examiner, over a six year period. We then estimated how many joggers there were in Rhode Island, and we did that, we did that by doing a random digit telephone survey. We had these three women who spoke all the common Rhode Island languages, English, Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, profane. Because there are a lot of people that don't like to answer phone calls at 6.30 and 7 p.m. at night. But what we did is we were able to estimate the amount of time people spent exercising and the amount of time people spent in sedentary behavior. And particularly this was jogging. I said exercise, but we're talking about jogging. And when you look at that, you're seven times more likely to drop dead during exercise than at rest. Now, I'm not talking about the fact that I showed you earlier that exercise is beneficial. I'm talking about the fact that if you're going to have your cardiovascular event, and it being sudden death. It's more likely to occur with exercise than at rest. Also, if you look at uh, the relative risk of a myocardial infarction, the relative risk of a myocardial infarction on a logarithmic scale by Murray Middleman all the way back in 1993, here's the overall risk of a myocardial infarction. But if you get no regular exercise, it's much more likely to happen during exercise. And even if you exercise five times a week, you're more likely to have your myocardial infarction during exercise and at rest. Recent study uh, uh, written by Jonathan Kim with some of us, uh, including Bill Roberts in this audience, uh, Aaron Bagish from Mass General was the, was the senior author on that. But he looked at cardiac arrest during long distance events, US marathon, uh, full and half marathons over 10 years. There were only 59 cardiac arrests. They were higher in men, much higher in men than women, and I say this all the time, women have a lower risk of sudden cardiac death during exercise, but also any other time. They're less likely to die suddenly. Bystander CPR and non-hypertrophic cardiomyopathy predicted survival. And the overall risk was low. The overall risk was low. Now, why did I put the question marks after that? Because we don't know how many people succumb during training. Because I've told you already, we do believe, and most people would agree, that there's an increased risk of a cardiovascular event during exercise. Now, it was a small study. When you look at the number who consented and consented, um, there are only 59 total. It turned out to be a small study. But that's good news, right? Because people aren't dropping like flies running marathons. The usual list of suspects were associated with events. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or possible hypertrophic cardiomyopathy had about a quarter of events. But over here is something interesting. Myocardial ischemia was also responsible for 16% of the events. And plaque rupture was not found on the angiograms or autopsies in any of those coronary artery disease patients. So they had a cardiac collapse during exercise but there was no evidence of what we call plaque rupture. So let's talk about plaque rupture for a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a, another study um, looking at a far larger number of subjects, and there were 63 who had events during sports, and they're on top. And again, you can see that there are some acute coronary events, and then there are also some coronary events that are non-acute here, in which there's not any evidence of a coronary thrombosis. So let's talk about ruptures in the plaques, cracks in the plaques for those who aren't cardiologists. So here's a coronary angiogram, and boy, that coronary angiogram looks pretty good. But right at this point is an intravascular ultrasound, an IVUS. And so there's the IVUS ca uh, catheter. And what you can see is that even though that artery looks normal, there's an enormous amount of atherosclerosis in that coronary artery. The artery remodels when you start to deposit cholesterol. It remodels. The artery dilates out to the size to accommodate that atherosclerosis. Now, let me point out what you've got. You've got a flexible part of the artery here, and you've got a very stiffened part of the artery here, stiffened from atherosclerosis. And remember, we call these things the coronary arteries. Why? Because they crown the heart. They're the coronation arteries. And every time your heart beats, they're basically along for the ride. So if you take a rubber hose and you put it out in the sun, it gets stiff, right? And if you bend that rubber hose, what happens? You get a crack. And that crack makes the hose useless. Well, the same thing happens to your coronary arteries. As they flex, and this flexibility meets inflexibility, you can get a crack in the coronary plaque. 
Now, if you get a crack in the coronary plaque, two things can happen. It can heal or it can clot. And if it clots, that's an acute myocardial infarction. Shown a little bit better here. This is the lumen. Here's a cholesterol deposit. Here's a thin fibrous cap. Here's a thick fibrous cap. This is unlikely to rupture. This is likely to rupture. If there's flexing here, you're likely to get a crack in the coronary plaque leading to an acute cardiac event. And indeed, most myocardial infarctions, if you look at the stenosis prior to an MI, most myocardial infarctions, 68%, happen when there's less than a 50% stenosis. The artery isn't tight. You can't see it on an angiogram, but it's dangerous. This is a report that we published um, with the guys from Tufts looking at uh, three men who had acute coronary thrombo thrombosis during the 2011 Boston Marathon. So you can see, I think, that there's this, this is the left anterior descending, and you can see that there's this haziness there, and that's that clot, and here's after angioplasty. Here's another circumflex in another person, totally occluded, opened up, and there's the left anterior descending. And here's a circumflex, closed off, opened up, beautiful artery. So during exercise, flexing of those coronary arteries probably causes cracks in the plaques, which can lead to an acute myocardial infarction, occasionally sudden death. So we got to point out, though, that if you look at autopsies of suicide and accident victims, they demonstrate not infrequent <clears throat> asymptomatic plaque rupture. So you take somebody who killed themselves, you slice their coronary arteries, and there are plaque ruptures. So that means that many of us are rupturing plaques all the time, but they heal. And we're going to come back to the healing in a minute. But whether you get an acute cardiac event or not depends on other things. What's your platelet function? Are you exercising? Is the blood pressure up, et cetera, et cetera? OK. I'm going to move on if I could do this. Uh, so acute cardiac events during exercise remain a problem. I'm going to talk about that in healing of plaques in a minute. So let's talk about cardiac biomarkers. So here's a study way back in 1980 by Art Siegel, who did a lot of the early work in this area. And what he did is he looked at CK levels in runners in the 1979 Boston Marathon. 15 physicians who had these CK levels before the race and these CK levels after the race. Why was it important? In those days, CK levels were used to diagnose muscle injury of the heart, myocardial infarctions. So the elevation of CK was concerning. But we all know that eccentric exercise raises CK levels. And Boston is a very eccentric race. You start here out at Hopkinton, you run all the way down to Newton Lower Falls, then you climb the hills, including heartbreak, and then you run downhill again. So you lose 440 feet or so in the Boston Marathon, but you do it twice. So it really beats the dickens out of your legs. So you probably get more CK injury, so more muscle injury from that eccentric downhill running than in other marathons. But certain, shortly thereafter, Siegel and his friends looked at not just creatinine kinase, creatine kinase, but the creatinine kinase MB, or myocardial band. And they also found that that was elevated in runners. But they did an interesting thing. They biopsied the lateral gastrox of 25 marathon runners, 10 controls, three weeks post the 1981 Boston. And what they found is that the skeletal muscle of the runners had become more cardiac-like. It, there was more CKMB in the gastrocinemius of these runners than there were in the muscles of controls. They noted that fetal cells, that fetal muscle, has a lot of CKMB. And they wondered if increased levels in the runners could be due to repair. Now, if you injure a muscle, what do you do? You bring in satellite cells. Those satellite cells are pluripotential cells. They repair the muscle. So they went back in a subsequent study, and they demonstrated that there were increased satellite cells in that muscle. So what's the explanation? Runners are constantly injuring their skeletal muscle, which is being repaired using satellite cells. Uh, they're pluripotential. They can make cardiac enzymes. Injured satellite cells release the CKMB after the race. Case dismissed. It's all the muscle. And then along came a group that did a lot of work in this as well, Rob Shave's group from London. And what they looked at is 72 runners in the London Marathon. Now, an abnormal troponin, this is looking at troponin T, troponin T. And troponin is thought to be extremely specific for cardiac muscle, OK? So they looked at troponin T. And this is an abnormal value, greater than 
And a lot of these runners had values that were abnormal, that suggested that there was some sort of cardiac injury going on. And it's not just running a marathon. If you take a bunch of runners and you have them run a treadmill marathon, and you measure cardiac troponin T before and every 30 minutes, what you found is that all of them increased their troponin T within one and two hours of exercise, and all were normal within one hour of the finish, and that many of them had a second late peak. And this is what it looked like. So you had in these slides are courtesy of Rob. So you can see that you had this peak, and then another peak, a peak, and another peak, although some people had one peak and no more. Now, this is cardi cardiac troponin T. And I, as a clinician, always tell the cardiac fellows that T stands for trouble because cardiac troponin T can be affected by some other things, although we still think it comes from the heart. But they've also shown this with cardiac troponin I, which is much more specific for the cardiac muscle. And let me tell you one other thing. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This is a study that, um, uh, 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 that Tice did as well when he was with his Tice Eisvogels. But the people really behind it were Beth Taylor, who recruited all the subjects. Um, Amanda Zaleski, uh, they recruited the subjects before and after the Boston Marathon. Aaron Bagish was so helpful in providing us access. But you can see here, every single runner in that race that we measured had an increase in cardiac troponin I, a much more, well, at least we think somewhat more specific. So um, there is some hope that it's still from muscle. This is an article from Alan Jaffe looking at diseased skeletal muscle. And what he looked at at the Mayo Clinic were a bunch of folks who had muscle diseases, such as inflammatory myositis, uh, inclusion body myositis, necrotizing immunodilated um, myositis, diseases not to have thought to affect the heart. And he was able to show that cardiac troponin T is up. So most of us think that those troponins are coming from the heart, and the, and the people who know a lot about cardiac troponin say it can't come from any other place, but there's still the possibility that some of it may be injury to muscle and not necessarily injury to heart. But we have to entertain the idea that running even relatively short events, like within an hour, um, can cause releases of cardiac troponin, uh, perhaps signaling myocardial injury. Okay, I want to talk about ventricular dysfunction with exercise. So this is a study, again, from Shave's group uh, looking at folks who um, ran events less than three hours, three to 10 hours, greater than 10 hours. And this is left ventricular ejection fraction. And I think you can see that left ventricular ejection fraction looks like it's decreased. But the, the, va the, the ventricle that seems to be most affected by exercise is not the left ventricle, but the right ventricle. Way back in 1990, Pam Douglas, uh, who was later to become the chief of cardiology at Duke, measured echo parameters in participants in the Hawaiian triathlon. And what she was able to show is that after exercise, left ventricular, left and right atrial sizes were reduced, whereas the right ventricular size increased and didn't look like it functioned as well, and she called it right ventricular fatigue. Here's a study looking at uh, transient myocardial tissue and function changes in less fit marathon runners. So here's the squeeze or the contraction of this section of the intraventricular septum, here's the right ventricle, left ventricle, interventricular septum, before exercise and after exercise. And what do you see? Well, you see a marked reduction in the percent squeeze of those segments of the myocardium, the interventricular septum, the part separating the right and left ventricles. Here's a very interesting study by Andrew Lagersh. And Andrew Lagersh has done, he's a, a fellow from Australia who spends a lot of time in Belgium very interested in the right ventricle and its effects, and I'll quote a several of his studies right now. But he looked at exercise-induced right ventricular dysfunction and structural remodeling in endurance athletes. 40 athletes before and one week after races of three to 11 hours duration. Right ventricular volume increased, left ventricular volume decreased. BNP, now BNP is a measure of cardiac stress, uh, uh, BNP, in, car in cardiac troponin I correlated with the decrease in right ventricular ejection fraction and the right ventricular ejection fraction decreased with the event duration. The longer the event, the more the effect on the right ventricle, and with individual VO2 max. Those individuals who are the best endurance athletes seem to affect their right ventricle the most. So the right ventricle seems strangely more vulnerable. 
So why is it? Why could the right ventricle be more vulnerable? Well, right ventricular wall stress is low at rest. It's lower than the left ventricle at rest because there's lower pulmonary artery pressure. But there's increase in pulmonary artery pressure that's relatively greater than the increase in systemic blood pressure. So the increase in wall stress, there's a greater increase in RV wall stress, 125 versus 4% according to Andre. So this is the right ventricle, and this is the left ventricle during exercise. And remember, that increased wall stress is imposed on a thinner right ventricular wall. We're going to move on, but we're not going to really leave the right ventricle too far, because now we're going to talk about <clears throat> cardiac fibrosis in lifelong endurance athletes. So what we use is we use something called LGE, or late gadolinium enhancement, to measure myocardial fibrosis. And that's because gadolinium enters myocardial areas of fibrosis. It enters them because the filament structure allows retention. So the gadolinium, you know, with the muscle cells, they're lined up, and there's not much room for the gadolinium to get in. But with fibrosis, the collagen is at angles. So the gadolinium can get in there, and it's stuck. So it's a marker of myocardial uh, scarring and fibrosis. So let's go back to Andre's study. And what he found is that there was late gadolinium enhancement in five of the 39 who participated, who got um, cardiac MRs. And it was more common in those who had exercised the longest, meaning they had been engaged in endurance exercise the longest. Not the only study. Here's a study from um, Greg White's group, Sanjay Sharma, in uh, Great Britain. And they looked at 12 lifelong endurance athletes, very good endurance athletes. Many of them had been national champions, Olympic participants, but they had continued to exercise. They were in this age group. Six of the athletes had late gadolinium enhancement. Now, one of them was probably a silent myocardial infarction, so let's exclude that. But at least some of the athletes had late gadolinium enhancement. And late gadolinium enhancement was associated with what? Years of training, number of marathons, number of ultra endurance marathons, suggesting again that those who had participated in lifelong endurance exercise had evidence of myocardial scarring. So here's a normal intraventricular septum, and here's what they found. They found late gadolinium enhancement in the septum and at the hinge point between the right and left ventricle, in the intraventricular septum and at the hinge points, at the hinge point, at the hinge point and in the inter at the hinge points and throughout the interventricular septum. So the late gadolinium enhancement seemed to preferentially involve the septum and the hinge points of the septum. Let's talk about accelerated atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. In this case that I'm going to present is presented with permission. So this is Ambrose Burfoot, who won Boston in 1968 in the time of 227.17. Not a great time. But he won Boston, and it was very hot. His best was considerably better, 214 in Japan, Fukuoka. He's run the annual Manchester um, road race. It's about a 4.7 mile road race or so for the last 54 years. That's a typo, 54 years. He still runs about 25 miles weekly, does a lot of interval training. His coronary artery calcification score is 946. Now, what does that mean? So when you deposit atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries, you also deposit calcium. A value less than 100 doesn't, it means you've got some atherosclerosis, but it's not a very threatening value. A value of above 400, we're much more concerned, and a value of 960 whatever is extremely high. It's a high value. If you've got a value of zero, you've got a ticket to ride for 10 years. You're almost, not totally, as Yogi Berra said, it's hard to predict the future, especially in advance. But if you've got a zero coronary artery calcification score, you have a very good ticket to ride for the next 10 years. So that's a very high value. Stefan Molenkamp looked at coronary artery calcification scores in his uh, study of uh, imaging studies in Germany. They performed cardiac imaging and follow-up on a large population of German subjects. They have 108 runners who have done uh, more than four marathons. And they controlled them for age and FRS. What's FRS? Framingham Risk Score. So they're going to look at coronary artery calcification, and they're going to control it for their atherosclerotic risk factors.
So as expected, terrible slide, but as expect, sorry, as expected, their BMIs are lower, their smoking is less, their blood pressure is lower, their LDL is uh, lower, their HDL is considerably higher, their Framingham risk score is remarkably lower. If you look at their coronary artery calcification, when you look at the raw numbers, sorry, when you look at the raw numbers, the raw number is lower in the marathon runners than it is at the age match controls. But when you control for age and risk factors, when you control for age and risk factors, the marathon runners are higher. Another study. Now, look, Missouri Medicine uh, does not have an impact factor of 17, right? It's a relatively obscure journal. But this is a study looking at marathons in the long run and, and showing increased coronary artery plaque volume among male marathon runners. So it's 50 male marathon runners, assembled really by Bill Roberts, who completed one marathon a year for 25 years. And I think it was the Twin Cities Marathon. There were 23 male controls, and they weren't really all that well matched um, when you look at the paper. They looked, did high resolution coronary computed tomographic angiography, and this is what they found. If you looked at total plaque volume, if you look at calcified plaque volume, notice that p-value. If you looked at non-calcified plaque volume, it was all greater in the athletes. The athletes appeared to have more plaque, and they especially had more calcified plaque. The marathoners had more coronary artery calcification than expected. Why? Because running increases coronary artery disease. Remember, atherosclerosis is a disease of turbulence. Atherosclerosis, or cholesterol, is deposited with this disruption of laminar flow. One of the reasons we think that the coronaries get affected so early is that every time your heart beats, there's twisting and turning of those coronary arteries, which can disrupt that laminar flow. But the carotid siphon, the bifurcation of the aorta, the, um, the femoral arteries uh, at the iliac uh, area, because they're, you know, those, are, those arteries are often bent or turn, and that turbulence deposits atherosclerosis. Maybe the exercise does something about that. Maybe runners cause plaques to rupture, and those plaques heal. And in the healing process, calcium is deposited. A lot of experts think that dense calcium is a sign of plaques which are ruptured and been healed without causing an acute cardiac event because exercise increases parathyroid hormone. And I've learned so much from Ben Levine over the years, and this is one of the things he taught me when we talked about this years ago. And he pointed out that exercise acutely increases parathyroid hormone. I'll show you that in a minute. Or because present risk factors do not reflect past risk factors. Let's talk about that for a minute. In Mollenkamp's study, the risk factors were great, but were they great all their life? If your cholesterol is good now because you lost weight and you got religion and got a good diet, does that abdicate all of what's happened in the past, you know, 50 years? No, of course not. So these people, when they're controlled for their risk factors now, have not been controlled for their lifelong exposure to risk factors. But the data are the data. Here's the effect of prolonged exercise on parathyroid hormone, two hours of moderate intensity cycling among some competitive cyclists. Here's the serum parathyroid hormone level before and then after exercise, almost a 75% increase. And even after you correct for plasma volume, parathyroid hormone levels go up. And what do we know about or hyperparathyroidism? We know that hyperparathyroidism causes vascular um, calcification. So at least a possibility. Now the other question we've got to ask, is more calcium bad? I told you that if you want to look to see if someone has atherosclerosis, you do a coronary artery calcification score, right? So is more coronary artery calcification bad? And the answer is yes and no. So if you look at um, by volume score quartiles of coronary artery calcification, and these are, you can see that as the coronary artery calcification goes up, the risks of vascular disease, the hazard risks for coronary heart disease, and the hazard risk for cardiovascular disease, they both go up. But look over here. If the calcification is dense, as the density goes up, the level goes down. And clinically, the athletes that I'm frequently sent with very high coronary artery calcification scores, it has to be dense, because you can't get that high a score without a lot of concentration of calcium. So is all that calcium bad? We don't know. And we especially don't know in runners 
and I continue to let AMB run. What the other interesting thing is that statins actually increase coronary calcification. Now, if there's a life-saving drug out there, it's, coronary, it's, it's statins. Statins are life-saving drugs. Even though most of my NIH work over the last few years has been on criticizing statins, looking at muscle injury, statins are life-saving drugs. But curiously, they increase coronary artery calcification. This is a hard slide, so let me show it to you. This is total atheromatous volume in blue, and we're only going to emphasize over here. HIST stands for high intensity statin therapy, high intensity statins. If you're on high intensity statins, your total atheromatous volume goes down. If you're on low intensity statins, your total atheromatous volume goes down. If you're on no statin, your atheromatous volume goes up. But look at what happens to the change in calcium. As your, as your, cholesterol, as your atheromatous goes down, your calcification goes up. More on high intensity statins, well not significantly different, but clearly looking at the no statin, this is different than the low intensity, which is different than the high intensity. So even those statins get cholesterol out of plaques, even those statins save lives, they paradoxically increase coronary artery calcification. And it's thought to go like this. Here's your atheromena with a lot of cholesterol, no statin, the whole thing progresses. Statin, you remove some of that cholesterol and you put in these calcified dense plaques, which help stabilize the atheroma. Let's talk about atrial fibrillation <clears throat> in athletes. And here we have what's probably a J-shaped curve. So is AFib more common in endurance athletes? This is a paper we tried to get published way back in about 2007. It was looking at atrial fibrillation in endurance athletes. There were at that time one, two, three, four, five, six trials, all of which, six reports, all of which said atrial fibrillation was more common in endurance athletes, could not get this bugger published. Nobody wanted to believe that atrial fibrillation was more common in lifelong endurance athletes. We finally got it published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, for which I'm grateful. I wrote this editorial just recently on physical fitness, physical activity, exercise training, and atrial fibrillation, and the conclusion is that it seems to have a bit of a J-shaped curve with exercise. So here's a recent study in Jack that took a lot of people and wound up with a cohort of 308 folks. And what they did, and all of these people had atrial fibrillation. They all had atrial fibrillation. And it's from Australia, and they couldn't get them in to have atrial fibrillation ablation, which is where we put catheters in the left atrium and we ablate the pathways for the atrial fibrillation. But these folks had to wait. So in the time that they were waiting, they got exercise tests, cardiorespiratory fitness, and then they also were given the choice of entering a cardio, um, an exercise training program. So if you look at baseline fitness, those whose exercise performance was greater than the 100th percentile had the longest period without recurrence of atrial fibrillation, ablation-free, drug-free atrial fibrillation. And over here is the total atrial fibrillation freedom. So if you're in great shape when you have your atrial fibrillation, you're less likely to have recurrences. On the other hand, if you're in crummy shape, you're more likely to have recurrences. So what happened with exercise training? If you gained fitness, more than two METs gain while you were waiting, your atrial fibrillation was less likely to reoccur, both total freedom, whatever. You were more likely to have total freedom from atrial fibrillation. So exercise training seemed to reduce the chance of having recurrent atrial fibrillation. Now, some of that may be due to weight change, and um, I won't go through the slide too much, but they also addressed weight change. And so here are the people that lost more than 10% of their body weight and gained their performance, lost more than 10%, did not gain their performance. And what you basically see is that if you lose weight, you do better. If you lose weight and get fit, you do best. So exercise for people who are you know, not necessarily that good at baseline seems to improve their ability to with, with not have atrial fibrillation. On, other, on the other hand, if you look at long distance cross country skiers, a bunch of skiers, almost uh, 53,000, who skied in the 56 mile Veselopet race in, in these years and were followed over the next period, those who had participated in the most races had the most AFib. Now, how do they know that? Well, in Scandinavia, they, or at least in Sweden, they have good medical records, you know, national medical records. So you can go in there and see what the person was admitted with, what their diagnoses were. But those who participated in the most races, 
they had more AFib. Those who, did, um, who were the fastest tended to have more AFib, but that was not statistically significant. Another study looking at um, the adjusted odds ratio by years of exercise. So this is the effects of years of endurance exercise on the risk of atrial fibrillation and flutter. The more years of exercise you have, the more likely you were to have atrial fibrillation and the more likely you were to have atrial flutter. So why? Why would you get atrial fibrillation? Why would you get atrial flutter if you're a lifelong endurance exercise? Well, increased vagal tone. Increased vagal tone slows heart rate. Slower heart rates gets more chance for an ectopic beat to capture the atrium and put you into atrial fibrillation. Also, vagal tone causes what we call electrical dispersion, which predisposes to atrial fibrillation. There's also increased sympathetic tone with exertion. Atrial enlargement. The atria get considerably larger in lifelong endurance athletes. Look at my body size. My body size is quite small, and yet I have an incredibly large left atrium, almost 15 millimeters. There's also a risk of increased inflammation. I'm putting my money on atrial enlargement and increased parasympathetic tone. Here's a study from Antonio Policcia looking at almost 2,000 elite athletes in Italy. Normal left atrium is less than 40. 20% 20 of these athletes were greater than 40. 11% were greater than 45. So lifelong, or at least high levels of endurance activity increased left atrial size. I want to talk about genetic vulnerability to exercise because I think for me, this is a potential paradigm changer. This is a study in October 2013 about exercise increasing the age-related penetrance and arrhythmia risk of this thing called arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia cardiomyopathy in those who have the mutation. So arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy is the disease of the right ventricle. These, it's caused by problems in desmosomes, and these desmosomes provide the mechanical connection between myocytes. They keep the myocytes together. So if you've got a defect in any of the proteins that affect the desmosomes, you have a chance for these uh, myo uh, the cardiac filaments to pull apart. When they pull apart, there's damage to the muscle, fibrosis, and fatty deposits. And that's what's characteristic of right ventricular cardiomyopathy. There's deposits of fat and fibrosis in the right ventricle. There are genetic defects that produce this, and there are genetic defects in the desmosomes, but the penetrance is very variable. And so it's always been wondered, what are the environmental factors that a family can have kids with the same gene defect in very different presentations? So what the authors did is they queried 87 folks who had desmosomal defects, and they asked them about their exercise. So if you're an endurance athlete, Yes, you were much more likely, saying, you know, these are all genetic defects, you were much more likely to meet the criteria for right ventricular cardiomyopathy. The more exercise you got over the prior year, the more likely you were to have right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Here's the survival. If you're a non-athlete, you survive better than an athlete. And this is survival from your first ventricular uh, tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. And what right ventricular cardiomyopathy does is it, it can, has the risk to kill you because it, it produces ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, especially associated with exercise. So here are the non-athletes up here, and here are the athletes, and this is survival um, uh, class for congestive heart failure. Again, less exercisers did better survival from their first sustained VFib VS versus those who were exercisers. So remember, what's most vulnerable? to exercise. We think the right ventricle. So if you're stretching that right ventricle, and if you have desmosomal defects, give me a break. Come on. It's only 87 patients, for crying out loud. 87 patients. It's retrospective. It's a retrospective study. Give me a break. It stinks, et cetera, et cetera. So here are age and training dependent arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy in placoglobin deficient mice. I know many of you prefer to take care of mice, okay? So we're gonna talk about the mice who have a placoglobin deficient heterozygote. Now why are they heterozygotes? Because if they're homozygotes, they die. They don't make it out of utero. With and without exercise training. So here's 10 months and here's the wild type and here's the placoglobin uh, heterozygote. So you can see, without exercise training, the right ventricle is bigger, so you get a decent model. But look what happens if you're trained at six months. If you're trained at six months, you're exercise trained, it's like you're older than your 
normal age development of right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and that's shown here. So here's the wild type, three months, six months, 10 months. But if you're trained at six months, you're already worse off in your right ventricular volume than if you had lived for 10 months. So their conclusions were that heterozygous placoglobin deficiency provokes arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and presentation of the phenotype is accelerated by exercise training, endurance training. And that's not the only mouse model. This looked at placophilin, desmoglein, desmoplakin, all of them show that if you exercise train with these defects, you get more right ventricular enlargement. Some people actually propose, Andre Lagersh actually proposes that exercise can produce an arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy without genetic defects. Now, I really have problems with this, but I just want to be straightforward with you. Andre thinks, and the people he worked with, thinks that exercise alone, if you do enough of it long term, even without a genetic defect, can affect the right ventricle adversely. And so they've looked at exercise-induced right ventricular dysfunction associated with ventricular arrhythmias in endurance athletes. And they had 17 athletes who had severe right ventricular arrhythmias. And they were not, these folks were sick. 47% of them had had implantable cardiac defibrillators placed. This is highly speculative, right? Highly speculative. And we ask Andre, how frequent is that? He thinks it's extremely rare. You know, one in, the number he said to me is one in 500 individuals. But they do think, they think, I'm not so certain, nowhere near that, they do think that there may be the ability with enormous amounts of exercise training, even without uh, defects in your desmosomes. But the answer I really want to ask is, could similar deleterious effects occur with the genes for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? So what's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? It's just what it says. Pathy means disease of the heart muscle that's caused by hypergrowth, too much growth of the heart muscle, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And what happens is the ventricle gets thick, and especially the interventricular septum. But a lot of people have global hypertrophy. Now, could we worsen that because of accelerated myocardial injury or hypertrophy? One of the things we look at in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is we do MRIs to look at late gadolinium enhancement. And we know that if there's a lot of scarring in the heart, that there's an increased risk that that individual will have cardiac arrhythmias. So we're much more likely to put in a defibrillator or whatever. But we've already seen that there may be some fibrosis, some scarring that happens with exercise. Could it make hypertrophic cardiomyopathy worse? Oh, what about the long QT syndrome, right? Um, long QT syndrome can cause ventricular fibrillation because there's a long pause and there's all sorts of things that happen. But remember, bradycardia lengthens the long QT syndrome. Now, we adjust for this. We have equations to adjust for the bradycardia, but does the heart care that we've adjusted for the slow heart rate? The bradycardia could produce longer QTs. Could that cause a problem? What about Brugada syndrome? Brugada syndrome is a disease that's known to cause sudden death, often during sleep, when vagal tone is high. By exercise training in some folks, could we increase vagal tone and cause problems? Now, I've stopped here, but I can think of a lot of things as a clinical cardiologist that have both the benefit of exercise, okay, but the potential risk. Um, so Houston, do we have a problem? I really don't think we have a problem. Remember the slides show, the early slides. I came here not to uh, criticize exercise, um, but to uh, praise it. Um, endurance athletes routinely live longer. We all know that. If you're an endurance athlete, it goes back to the 1800s. If you're an endurance athlete, you live longer. But there is a question, is that endowment? I mean, are endurance athletes somehow endowed with a hardiness factor? They're hardier, so of course they live longer. Or is it training? Also, you've got to remember that there are very few studies that include athletes at the extreme right of the curve, way out where we're talking about it. For example, here's again from Tyson's paper. But if you look out here, here are people doing a lot of activity. Kind of flattens out. You don't see an increase. But even those amounts of exercise are not what real good endurance athletes do every day. Um, I think we do have some interesting clinical observations. 
I think they're clinically important. I think it's important to know that troponins go up with exercise. I think it's important to know that runners may have increased coronary artery calcification. I think it's important to know that you could look at a cardiac MR on a healthy athlete and maybe see some myocardial fibrosis. I think atrial fibrillation in lifelong endurance athletes is important because it's affecting a lot of individuals in this area. So I think it's very clinically important. And I think it really presents for us in general a real good learning as well as really excellent research opportunities. So, are there deleterious effects of prolonged endurance exercise? I think there are some. I think there's a possibility that over the um, next few years we'll find more. I'm not certain. It's certainly not an indictment of exercise, and I don't want to take that, I don't want anybody leaving here with that sort of conclusion. The folks we're talking about are people that have done prodigious amounts of exercise for long periods of time. So I want to thank the college for asking me to do this. I want to thank Ben, my friend for many years, and a person that I admire greatly for his work, for introducing me. Um, and also, I want to let you know what an honor it is to um, speak in the name of somebody who is such a giant as John Sutton. Thank you very much. <laughs>